Hope you're keeping up okay. We've got six for you this week, and then Michael Duggar will be joining me in the studio. We will start with Leicester. That's a simple question. Asked it already, but we'll ask it again. Should racing at Leicester have taken place this week, given the racecourse's positioning in Odeby, which is within the localised lockdown zone as stipulated by the government? On the one hand, I'm certain that all procedures were followed at Leicester and that, you know, it's outdoor work for the people that were on the race course. They can do socially distancing. We've been doing it for a few weeks now. You know, the racing industry's done a really good job, I think, of, you know, bringing racing back in a very safe way. And I'm sure uh, that it would have been no more dangerous than having racing at Lingfield or Yarmouth or anywhere else. On the other hand, uh, these races were worth 2700 quid to the winner it was a nine race card does that matter uh, did we really need to do it you know could, I you, just, make, can you make a judgment call based uh, on the quality I, I, of the racing if you I, make I, a judgment call on based on the quality of the racing you will then be accused of inconsistency i, I understand you what you're saying through. but th th this is the only meeting where there's it's been in a in a specific hot spot for the disease and you know you could it's not inconsistent to say this is a meeting that we can't hold because this is in a place where, you know, people are really suffering. Yeah, but you, uh, we're, we're going to have other hotspots pop up that's with other true. race courses within them. That's Windsor, for example, is in an area which is yeah, getting yeah. pretty close to an R rate of. But I mean, I, 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 I just felt like it was a bad look. And also, just from a racing point of view, having a flat meeting with no stalls. Uh, you know, sprint races and uh, one of the starts just was appalling, I thought. Um, it wasn't a very good, you know, it wasn't a very good betting product, it wasn't a brilliant advert for the sport. Um, I would have thought we could have lived without it and it would have been not too difficult to call it off. I don't think anyone would have been crying that much if it had No, but that's not the point, is it? It's a I, I, I get, the subsequent I, consequences. I get your point, and, I, you know, obviously it's slightly gesture politics and it's all about, you know, the visuals, but I don't think it's a good look, really. Never had you down as a gesture. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not particularly. How are we doing on the clock? I we can't have finished, you finished you're done, you're out. Um, you can hear the bell at home. Oh, okay. Neil can't hear, hear the in bell. Here. We turned the speaker yeah. down. The July derby. It was uh, the first. The first Saturday in July. It doesn't have quite the same ring about it. Uh, could it be here to stay? Do you think? Uh, would it be? Would it? Would you welcome uh, another month into the derby? Um, a bit I more narrative to develop. I mean, I, I. You know, I'm a person that used to go. Uh, I, I went. The, the first derby I went to was Reference Point, and I. I uh, you know, I remember that day, you know, it was a Wednesday, it was travelling on the train from central London, uh, mobbed full of people that really, you know, definitely were proper enthusiasts. And I, I sort of am a bit of a person to sort of, I don't like to kind of hark back to tradition, but I am a bit of a sort of a Wednesday derby guy. So the idea of I mean, not necessarily the July thing, but having the Derby and the Oaks on the same day was, I thought, was really exciting. You know, the three-day meeting, there are some other good races. You know, I quite like the Diamond Stakes and, you know, the Coronation is obviously a good race. Uh, but, you know, over the three days, it's not like a brilliant kind of festival, is it, really, the Derby meeting? So, I, I, I you know, I, I think if we lost that three days and it became a one-day thing, uh, every year in a brilliant day's racing, uh, that wouldn't be a terrible thing. Um, I mean, you know, there's also the whole kind of media and clashing with the football and, you know, I thought putting it back to 4.55, I didn't have a problem with that. That was great. Um, well, it's worked. It's worked by the viewing figure. Yeah, 2. yeah. 2.2 2 million is a good viewing figure for the yeah, Derby. Yeah, Very yeah, good yeah. Viewing yeah no. Right up on ITV and putting it at 4.55 mm. on a major network like that has worked. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And obviously they've had good viewing figures at Royal Ascot. So to follow that on, uh, it's kept the momentum going for them. I, I don't know. I'm, I'm, you know, like people in racing don't really like to change things, do they? I'm not afraid to fiddling around, you know, fiddling around with things. The interesting point will be whether the viewing, the whether the time can stay that way next year when you've got all the the finery and the flim flam and the royal presence and police ah, right, yeah, because yeah, it was always yeah. used as an, it was always used as the reason 
it was a police issue mm, that you couldn't mm. get people out and they didn't want the start time to be later. So hopefully now we can have that start time late because we've got a better viewing figure because of it. Weighing in light, it happened this week, Jockey weighed in light. And I was asked by Chris Dixon yesterday to ask you on this show, so I'm doing Chris's bidding, if a jockey weighs in light and the horse is disqualified, should the punters get their money back because they never had a chance? I think the horse that I backed with the remainder of my student grant money uh, about 30 years ago, I think it was Celtic shot running in its first novice chase. And it got beat and came second. And uh, I walked out of the betting shop disconsolately. Mm -hmm. And I got home. Uh, and later on, I suddenly thought, Do you know, I never looked to just check in case there was a steward's inquiry for some freaky reason. You know, I was clutching massively at straws because I was facing the prospect of living with no money for the last four weeks of term. And I looked on the teletext and the, the winner had failed to weigh in. And I went back and I collected my money the next day and I was absolutely delighted. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not a big one for justice refunds. I don't like all that, uh, you know, he was really unlucky, so we gave you your money back. Uh, I wish bookmakers would just lay a decent bet. Uh, and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm not really that bothered about special offers, but I understand that people are. Um, I, I think things that make it harder for bookmakers, uh, where they have to do double result and stuff like that, um, I think stuff like that that makes it easier for bookmakers to say, well, we have to restrict, uh, you know, marginal customers because we're giving so much away uh, is not a good thing for punters generally. Uh, so actually, no, I just think it's just like tough luck and you have to put up with it. Yeah, there was the, there was the debate for years, wasn't there, that you know, if, if a horse had whipped round at the start, as you mm. say, you'd, you should get your money back. Yeah, or the Amarillo. What was it? No, no, what was that one that ne never used to line up? Not Amarillo, just never used to win. Vodkatini, yeah, the yeah. other grey. Um, yeah, and that. Uh, when, he, I, when, he, when he refused to race in the Tingle Creek, which was one mm. of his highest profiles, because his yeah. favourite to beat Desert Orchid and receive yeah. all the weight, he walked back from the two mile start <laughs> past the grandstand and got booed. I was there. Which I was there that day. Yeah. 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 yeah, I remember that. Okay, uh, racing crowds. Well, we had a little smattering yesterday with owners let into mm. Epsom. It was a bit more atmospheric than it had been at, at Ascot. So we're getting there. What, from a personal standpoint, what do you think the courses should be doing now about letting a handful of people in, if anything? <laughs> it's difficult, isn't it? I mean, uh, I sort of feel like, uh, you know, it wouldn't be that difficult to have a kind of transitionary period where maybe you just let, I don't know, say annual members were allowed to come, but you didn't sell any tickets on the day, uh, so that you keep to a sort of reasonable number of people. That would be a good reward for those people. I'm sure most race courses have uh, uh, given them free annual membership for next year. But, um, you know, you could do something like that where you got, you know, a few hundred people turning up, but not thousands. Uh, you know, there's in a world where people can go to garden centres or outdoor markets or whatever, mm. it seems to me that going racing and standing outside in yeah. the fresh air can't be that dangerous. I mean, this is the key. Uh, you've, got to, you've got to persuade the government that the race course is a park rather than a stadium. Yeah, yeah, which basically it is, except for it's a facilities. park with a bunch of bars in it where people are going to stand very close to each other and breathe over each mm. other. Uh, and, and, you know, on course betting shops and that kind of thing. And, and the hospitality boxes well, it'll be an and restaurants. It'll be, it'll be an interesting experiment if you said, right, we can't open any of the bars mm. and hospitality but we obviously will have to provide you with a loo but now and yeah water. but now if but, I, yeah right how many of you want to come well okay yeah you that, can't go inside yeah. you stand outside whatever the elements are well some people would still you know, you, you know i remember going to Fontwell and you know people go and sit in their car with a picnic and stuff yeah. like that and that's quite I'm a nice day out. I'm to see if there'd be a take-up I though. think there would be a take-up but I think if you're running a small race course you would say that our business is quite precarious mm. and actually we need the bar to be open and we need the hospitality boxes we need some people to come and sit in the restaurant. But then without them you don't need to staff them so you're saving costs that way and yeah. if you've got a limited yeah. amount of people coming yeah. in then that might be a way of doing but it. But then obviously you know again there's also there's sponsorship implications isn't there like a lot of people sponsor a race so they can bring some clients mm along to the restaurant and have a private box and whatever uh, it, it's tricky I mean it's very tricky I think but I think they that's all, we're in a funny period and there should be a transitionary period that's your lot but we're moving on Scottish betting shops 
um, <laughs> you can't watch a race in a betting yeah. shop in Scotland at the moment because they don't want people congregating in there. <laughs> in, so I was in, bet, out. Yes. I mean, Julie, Williams, kind of did, Julie Williams a regular the on the show. Having she, the betting yeah, shop, isn't it? Julie Williams a regular on the show. I should have asked her if I'd have. You'd have told me this was coming up on Talking Points. I'd have asked her well, what it's like. Well, you arrived a bit earlier. Sorry right about that. Um, I guess... Um, <laughs> Well, it sort of harks back to the old days, doesn't it? You know, I can sort of imagine that Scottish betting shops right now, uh, you know, they, people are coming in, you know, smoking uh, through the sort of ribbons on the door and, uh, you know, the extels in the corner and the bloke sort of saying, you know, he's giving a good mention to the favourite and everybody's kind of leaning up they, closer to the thing. I mean, I uh, like your kind of um, sort of... The board man's there writing away. That's what, that's, yeah, that's... That would be great. Let's I go like back your to kind the of Proustian days. harking back to 1986 <laughs> in betting shops. Like this. But on a serious point, this is seriously damaging, isn't it? For well, I for mean, it, yeah, it's damaging in, in the Scotland. yeah shop people. You know, the way that people bet in betting shops. We don't need to be closing any more of these. No, shops. the way that people bet in betting shops these days is they bet race by race, and you know, there's a there's an action with virtuals and whatever. There's action, you know, every three minutes coming at you, foreign racing, greyhounds, whatever. Uh, whereas years ago, uh, people used to go into betting shops, you know, place their multiple bets for the day and mm. then go to work um, or, or, you know, go and get on with the rest of their life. That, that's not really how people use betting shops as much these days, I think. And, uh, yeah, I mean, obviously betting shops have suffered in the last few years and, you know, changes with fobties and whatever have not been as draconian as people thought in terms of the number of closures. Uh, but, I, I mean, irrespective of what they're doing in Scotland right now, I think that the, the lockdown period will be long-term damaging to betting shops. Uh, you know, we're moving towards a cashless society. Uh, people that didn't use to bet online may have given it a go for the first time during the lockdown. Uh, I, yeah, I think betting shops will be reduced by this period. Now, on a semi-related point, um, this week there was a tote kiosk open at Southall and yeah. it incurred the wrath of one or two of the on-track bookmakers who of course aren't allowed on the track Well I think on-course on on bookmakers are kind of the forgotten people aren't they really? I mean I would say you know some people would say one of the main reasons that you like to go racing is to see the horses in the flesh mm. around the paddock and I get that but for a lot of people over the years part of the drama and the day out of going racing is to have a bet in cash with a bookmaker and shop around for prices and that kind of thing. Now, I may be, again, you know, rose-tinted spectacles I, I because the betting are. ring isn't really like that anymore I, but I with, don't, a, but with I, a bunch of people are, kind of copying I'll, the exchanges. I'll tell but, you why, because I've hmm. taken... I mean, obviously, I'm doing the betting, they're not, they're underage. But I've taken my children hmm. racing a handful of times, they are young. Yeah. But the uh, the idea of me, them choosing the horse, me yeah. going to the bookmaker, handing over cash, yeah, yeah. taking a ticket, and if that horse wins, going and cashing the ticket, giving it back, is something that that e that even the youngest and and newest racing fan will cleave to. And the colour and the flavour and mm. the banter with those people is all brilliant. And I think the racecourses do underappreciate. Uh, how important to getting the crowd in, having the on-course bookmakers is. Um, but I also think that, you know, they don't have a big, powerful lobby. Uh, you know, the government are not going to think, I tell you what, there's a bunch of... I mean, you, you're talking about around about a thousand self-employed people, um, you know, who are sat at home twiddling their thumbs. They can't go out and work. There's no, There's nothing they can do to get money. Uh, they, they've fallen through most of the schemes, so... Uh, yeah, I feel sorry for them, and I think it was a bit of a spit in the eye for them to turn on the TV at Southall, it where it's up. supposed to be essential workers only, mm. and there's a tote booth open. Uh, you know, there was, what, 12 owners mm. there or something? I mean, who are they supposed to be taking bets from? I don't really know. Me? The stable you? staff <laughs> and uh, the media. I mean, I don't know whether the media and the stable staff were having a lot of bets there, but... They said it was a trial, sorry, you finished with that, but they Wait. said it was a trial thing uh, just to sort of get practice ready to get going again. But the, the, I actually think the on-course bookmakers wouldn't mind a trial. And that, on that note, we will leave it. Those were this week's Talking Points.
Subscribe to Racing TV to be notified when more Luck on Sunday videos are appearing online. And don't forget to join me for the show every Sunday morning from 9 o'clock with the best guests.